there we go. And Sarah, would you mind reading who's attending for those who? Sorry, do you mean read out loud or? Yeah, just for the recording, if that's okay. Read out loud who's attending. Sure, so yeah, so we have Barbara Sullivan, Village to Village Network, myself from Mather, um, uh, going down the list of participants. And I apologize, my cat is walking across my screen right now, but um, mm -hmm. Eddie Rivas from Potomac Community Village, Marie from Cornell, William Emmett, Amy Benedict, uh, Quia, Cheryl Baumgardner, Edmund Elizabeth Barnett, uh, GM Prevost, Jean Myers, Village of Chicago, Kate Harris, uh, Tent or T E N T, Leslie Wharton, Madeline Koenig, Brookside Nature Center, Marcia Salvery, Westside Pacific Villages, Nina Lynch. Uh, we have someone coming across with a phone number, um, an 832 phone number. And Ron Maddell, and apologies if I mispronounced any names there. And Carol Lee, Tierra Santa Village of San Diego. Thank you. Yeah, I think I, I may have missed people as folks were joining. So apologies for that as well. Um, Someone said oh, three of us together from Tent and the Tent yeah. offices. And Tent is Taos Elders and Neighbors Together. Correct. Okay. All right. Well, well, thank you for that, everyone. Um, and thank you for joining us. So we can definitely give sort of an overview of the RISE program, but I'd like to open it up to questions to start out with. Um, if anyone does have specific questions they were hoping to get answered today. Sarah, I could do like a five minute version of the present our presentation or I, we could go right to questions it's totally up to you whatever you whatever people sure. prefer i think a little five minute overview would be really super okay so let me share my screen if that's okay uh can sarah can you let me share my screen sorry <laughs> isn't it safe three o'clock i don't know you guys are too late. Really? Just a reminder to put yourself on mute if you're not already. I'm doing it, Marie. Hang on. One Thank second. you. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> okay. Marie, you should be able to share your screen. Okay, let me try again. Yep. Okay. So hold on. PowerPoint mode. Okay. So this is just a little bit about the RISE program, the Retirees in Service to the Environment. Um, and Carl Philomer will be joining shortly. Um, and obviously we're working in, we're coming from the Cornell Institute for Translational Research on Aging. We're in at Cornell University in the Department of Human Ecology, um, focused on aging and health. Um, and this is a partnership with Village Village Network and Mather. Um, so that's why there's kind of a, an assortment of people on this call. Um, and um, so I'm going to kind of skip over this. The whole point is just to give you a little bit more information about um, the purpose of this particular RISE partnership. Um, and also a little bit more about the RISE program. So the whole basis of the RISE program is it, it looks at environmental sustainability and um, you know, the, the importance of older adults being part of that um movement so the ultimate goal is to develop uh older environmental stewards to contribute their knowledge and skills to 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 their communities so the whole basis is that uh, we feel that not only older adults have the expertise and skills to contribute to this movement but also um that there's they have more energy uh excitement and um are uniquely affected by the environment as well. Um, if, if so, there's a lot of papers and research we've done on this program and the kind of the intersection of aging and climate change. Um, so, but the whole goal is to help uh, older adults, and I'm you know whatever term you want to use, <laughs> um, be uh, 
uh, work in their own communities to help with this change. Um, so, and one of the benefits of environmental volunteerism is that it promotes active aging. So it's not just that uh, um, to provide back to the community, but it's also, you know, typically environmental uh, stewardship uh, activities involve being outside, being uh, physically active. Um, so, and we have tested this particular program. The RISE program, part of it is based on just leadership skills and then also figuring out uh, how you can contribute your own skills to uh, improve the environment in your community and how you can give back to your community. But then it's also getting knowledge. So, so part of it is leadership skills and being able to advocate for yourselves. We have found that uh, without this part of the program, if you're not able to advocate for yourselves, you might end up volunteering at an environmental organization, but they're gonna put you in the back room filing papers. So the whole goal of this program is to kind of um, help you uh, advocate for yourself and what you want uh, and your skill set at volunteering at an organization or creating your own uh, uh, way to give back in your community, you know? So it doesn't have to be an organization. It could be on your own, obviously, or, or with others. Um, so, so we have tested this program. Again, we have a, on our website, you can, you can access all of our papers where we've studied the impact of this program. Um, again, for the benefits for participants, it's improved physical and psychological well-being, increased social integration, growth in environmental knowledge and community leadership skills. And then for communities, increased number of environmental volunteers, increased expertise of volunteers. Um, so, uh, so this program that we are putting together, we have, uh, we have speakers already lined up for them that with knowledge in uh, water quality, climate change, I can, I have the list of speakers. We have to conf confirm their exact dates though. Um, um, but I can, uh, well, I won't share it, but I can give you the list in a minute. Um, so one of the benefits of being virtual for this program is that we can pull nationally. We don't have to just focus on uh, the leaders in a certain area. Um, so we have been able to schedule that. Um, Right, so this is an eight week long commitment. And the first intro workshop, again, is based more on leadership skills. And um, then you have these uh, virtual environmental workshops with experts in the field and they give a presentation and then you are able to ask questions, to learn uh, more, more spe ask spe questions specific to your area or just what you're interested in learning more about. And, and ideally these environmental workshops are supposed to be sort of uh, making you think more about how you might wanna be involved. You might be more interested in, for example, uh, like waste management or recycling than you are, or beekeeping, or, you know, there, there's a range of topics. Um, um, and then the ultimate goal is to plan a capstone stewardship project at the end, so the last, the last workshop of the eight weeks is based on thinking of your own project and we often encourage group projects. So for example, the four people from tent, you wouldn't have to, but the ultimate goal would maybe, instead of just thinking about what you could do yourself, but something that may be a little bit bigger because four of you wouldn't be involved in that area, um, in, that, in that community. So thinking of one project for the four of you, you decide, you know, you could do a stream cleanup. It doesn't really, it could be big, or it could be small. It could be based on what your availability is, what your interest is, um, what the needs of your community are. The goal is just to think of like uh, how you can give back to the community, how you can be involved in your community, what, you know, thinking more about what your community needs. That could be just even advocating for something, you know, calling a legislator. It doesn't, it does not, it's all based on, you know, your availability, your interests. Um, and again, if the three out of four people from your uh, community are interested in, are interested in different things, then you could do something on your own. It's a group project is not mandatory. It's, um, it's encouraged, but it's it, individual projects are fine too. 
Um, yeah, and then post training, you would carry out that project, whatever that may be. Um, so this again, I don't think we need to go too specific. This goes a little bit detail. I said I'd do five minutes, I'm way over. Uh, so this is the leadership training. Again, it's it's learning the skills to become effective environmental volunteers, leadership and communication. So a lot of it is just communicating, you know, what your needs are, what your interests are, how that aligns with if you're working in an organization with their mission and goals. Um, and then there is a part of it where it's just like understanding uh, how to read a research article, understanding how to talk to research experts or um, to kind of uh, to understand, you know, exactly what's being said and what's not being said. <laughs> Um, yeah, and then more about this capstone stewardship project. So you can think about like, oh, as you're listening to all these different workshops, oh, that reminds me, we need this in our area, or this isn't, wouldn't this be a good thing? Um, so these are sort of the basic uh, topics. We have some more specific topics already kind of lined up based on national speakers we've done, but there one is, I think, one's very much on climate change and health. One's on water quality, one's on composting, one's on. So I can again, I can give you the list of the names of people and the topics, but the actual dates, they we have the eight weeks, but we're they're figuring out who goes when. Um, yep, so that's a stewardship project. And then some examples, prescription drug return day, recycling promotion campaign, school garden. We've, there's been so many, some people uh, who uh, you, I mean, I think the wonderful thing about this group is that you're very much in the community. Um, you know, we have worked with a lot of uh, more uh, one community based programs and or maybe in one uh, retirement home area. So there, you know, I think that what's great about this particular program is that the impact of participants can be more widespread um, um, and beneficial to community. So. Um, Right, so Sarah, do you want to take this from here? I feel like I'm talking too much. Is that okay? Yeah, no, thank you so much for doing that summary. Um, that's really helpful, especially for those who maybe weren't in our, our first call. But um, just to add some additional details for this pilot. So we've run a, a much smaller test pilot of the RISE program over Zoom um, with just a handful of Chicago villages. So. We wanted to expand that nationally, as Marie had said, and um, that's why we're looking for your participation. Um, it'll be eight weeks, starting Thursday, May 11th, I believe is our first kickoff. That's uh, correct, session. yeah. yeah. Um, I really think Marie covered a lot of it. As it's uh, All the speakers are scientists. I believe many of them are affiliated with Cornell. Some are not. Some of spoken with our, our Zoom pilot project. So um, all really great experts in their fields. Based on some initial questions that I've gotten from, from people interested in the pilot, um, I'd also say that this program is a really good fit, either if you're completely new to climate volunteering and even information and science um, on the environment, or if you're really experienced already have a strong interest in this type of volunteering and activism. This works really well for either side of that spectrum um, and everything in between. So that's a question I've gotten a lot. I just wanted to get ahead of that. Um, so I would love to take questions either in the chat or out loud. Let me make sure, okay, you should all be able to unmute yourselves if you do have a question. Sarah, would you please address the fact that we can get the videos after the fact that we're not stuck to a schedule for when we do this? Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. So we do record the sessions. Um, we would love to have people all be there at the same time when the sessions are live, because then you can ask your questions to our presenters. And obviously that's a benefit, but we understand it's an eight-week program. It would be kind of shocking if things didn't come up for some participants at some point. So we do record those. Um, you can play them afterwards. I believe we'll have them up for about two months after the initial session. At least that's what we did with our last 
pilot program. Um, Madeline in the chat asks, can you please share some examples of how RISE has partnered with other local organizations and or local government agencies and facilities? Um, Marie, I don't know if you have examples off the top of your head. I mean, so uh, all the publications were based on uh, partnerships with organizations uh, to, to run the program. Uh, but I, so I could probably follow up this call and do that. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, so what you should know is the RISE program in itself is available uh, free. We, we've developed and tested and uh, disseminate this program free of charge on our website. And so people can download the program and run it themselves. So this would be like an aging uh, organization or a environmental organization who wants to run the program to collect their own volunteers to then run it in their own community. So we keep track of people who have run it, but those are not our partnerships. Those are just people who run it. So we have, we obviously, when we partner with an organization, then we gather the research data on that, the run, how that goes, the evaluations, the, but when we also just disseminate the program, so anyone is free to use it. And then we do get feedback sometimes from people we ask for um, those who facilitate the program. We, we, we seek feedback on, have you used it? When did you use it? How many people participated? That sort of thing. So you'll see from the publications, um, I can, I'll put some links in the chat as we're talking, if people are interested. Marie and Sarah. Hey, Marie, it's of... Carl. I don't. I, I don't know if you. I don't know if anyone can hear me. I could add to that a little bit. Can I'm sorry. I, have, I got delayed and have to be on my phone. Can folks hear me? Yep. Yeah. Um. They. Uh. You know. That's a great question. And let me say. And folks, for the since I didn't get a chance to introduce myself, I'm working with uh, Marie and Sarah on this uh, program. So when we are from Cornell, I'm a faculty member there. When we uh, began RISE around 10 years ago, uh, it was a requirement that, that an organization that involved older people partner with an environmental organization. So uh, the initial idea was that an older person's organization, like a senior center, um, a, um, a county office for the aging, would the partner with a local environmental group and they would work uh, together on it. We since have dropped that as a requirement, but it certainly does occur. So there have been a number of partnerships of that kind and you are encouraged or more than welcome to. Just to give one example, one iteration of RISE had all of its volunteers become involved in a school gardening project. Uh, for elementary schools in a number of different communities. So they would go through RISE, but then there were partnerships with schools. Probably the ideal partnership is around uh, um, whatever the final project's gonna be. So if there's a water quality organization where you are, for example, uh, you know, you might partner with them on stream cleanups. Uh, if that was the idea behind the question, I hope, but the answer is, yeah, partnering with local groups is, uh, is a great thing to do. And I threw some uh, links to papers, but please, I didn't mean to overwhelm people, but just know some are specific to RISE and some are like the basis of the program. But there are some questions. Sarah, do you want to, do you mind? Yeah, of course. I, I've started looking at the questions in the chat and actually one from a bit earlier was what are some intergenerational aspects to, to RISE? Oh, and Eddie, I saw that you have your hand up, so we'll go to you next if you still have a question. Um, no, I, I, I was just going to stress the idea that, and some of my colleagues are on this call right now, where even though I'm a village leader, I've taken this program to my local park system, and we're going to be partnering with, with the county park system to offer the program to the general public, even though it will be advertised very um as well as we can to all the villages of our county, which are about 30 villages in this one county in suburban DC. So I think that's partly where the question was coming from about working with other entities besides the aging community. That's it. Yeah, no, thank you for that, that input. That makes a lot of sense. So certainly um, 
uh, as I, I think I started to write in the chat in response to um, Ron had asked, do we need to be members of a specific organization or can we join as a group of individuals? So what we were sort of anticipating was that groups would sort of arise from each village um, and, and connect in that way. But if you are part of an organization like Eddie was talking about um, and are able to recruit or connect to people through those organizations, um, you know, with the caveat that um, as, as Edmund asked, what are some intergenerational aspects to rise? So the, the eight week sessions are targeted towards folks, I believe it's 55 and better. Marie or Carl can correct me if I'm not exactly right on that. Um, and the intergenerational aspect would probably arise in your capstone project if that was something you were interested in. Yeah, I would agree with that uh, too. And just to say, yeah, we have one rise iteration in New York City. The, uh, the older participants went through it and then they organized an intergenerational exchange day as their capstone project where students from a local high school and they came together and did sort of environmental wisdom exchanges and uh, it actually led to some ongoing uh, relationships and partnerships. Just, but for the for the purpose of this iteration of Rise, I don't, you, there's no requirement to work with an organization. You know, and the goal is to to uh, be kind of a leader of a few other people at, within your village. I don't think that you could still participate if if you haven't um, gotten more than that. Just to... yeah, and we've sort of talked internally when planning this. You know. We find that a group of five people is a good minimum, but if you have a group of two or three and you're really dedicated and you go into your capstone project knowing you want to do something that you you can handle with that amount of people, then that's totally worth it as well. Um, and Elizabeth and Tim had asked in the chat, what's the best way to form a team? So I would say, you know, reach out to people within your village or potentially in other organizations that you're part of you know, spread the word, see who's interested. Uh, we'll plan to send out the Zoom information to sort of one uh, lead or liaison person, and then you can share that with the people that you're sort of teaming up with within your village. Uh, Ron asked, what do you mean by within your village? And I apologize if I'm misusing terms, obviously. Uh, we're really happy to partner with the Village to Village Network, but I'm, I don't have a lot of expertise. Um, so I don't know if, if Barbara, you can speak to that a bit. Am I? Well, actually, Ron, who who are you affiliated with? I'm, I'm kind of curious how you, you jumped on this call. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm with uh, TIP, Thrive in Place. Uh, and I'm actually president of the environmental group within a uh, 55 plus uh, community. Uh, and we are looking for ways of, of connecting with people who could speak on environmental topics as well as projects. So okay. you, you certainly are matching up with what we would like to do. I'm just so, wanting to make, make sure that, that I'm um, connecting with, with the right village. I, I'm, I'm not sure that the, what the term village uh, refers to here. We, so we are, you're, uh, you're, through, you're through affiliated tip. with TIP? Thriving yes. in place, yes. which is one of our villages, correct? Yes. Okay, so that's what what we're talking about. Our target audience was initially our villages that are part of the network, you know, village to village network, and and TIP is most certainly in that category. But there are other groups on this call that are affiliated with the village, but maybe a, a an environmental group that's you know working in coordination with the village. We're just asking some of the villages to take the lead. I think what Cornell and Mather are um, happy to do is accommodate some of the outside groups that are loosely affiliated with villages, but that are looking at the same impact environmentally. Um, and so most certainly it sounds to me as if you fall into that category. So when they're referring to the villages, this call is being hosted by the network and and we originally set it out to draw a lot of our member villages in. But we love the coordination and the cooperation of local, like Eddie has one, as he mentioned, um, 
affiliated with the villages that are doing environmental impact work within their community. Does that make sense? Does that sound correct? Uh, yeah, I, I think so. Uh, okay. See, I am a member of TIF, but my activity in environmental um, concepts or within environmental concepts is more related to the environmental club that I'm president of. And Perfect. That, that's where I would draw my, my people and, and my, my uh, I, I think the higher level of activity would come from that group. Uh, I think, I'm I think a member of great. TIP. Yeah, so Ron, I think that's great. If you wanna take the lead, what we're asking is, maybe you could draw a couple of your village members in also. You know, you get sure. somebody interested. That, that's, yeah, and Barbara, that's the point. Barbara, yeah. Barbara, I'm I'm one of the uh, board, I'm on the board of directors for TIP. Okay, good. And yeah. as, right. as Ron said, he is one of uh, one of our most valued volunteers. He does a lot of work for TIP, uh, but he also does this environmental work. And we don't really do, our, our focus in Thriving in Place is not on the social aspect of villages because our community does that. And we, I don't think that the board of directors of TIP wants to be in the position of, uh, of being directors or responsible for this. Although, you know, we recognize that it's a great thing for people to do, but we think that it is better handled through Ron's existing club that's part of the community. And Margaret, I get that. You know what? This is not something, it's sort of like some of the other programs we offered, you know, we offer through V2V, you mm -hmm. know, whether it's the Vivo classes or, you know, Vitality Society. It's a program that you can take to your members and say, hey, run with this. You know, be a leader, do do what you, if, if this interests you, you take the lead. I don't think boards, you know, personally, you know, I ran a village for 10 years. This is something I would have taken to my village members and say, hey, there's a great program. I'm not getting involved. If you all want to do it, run with it. You know, this yeah. is a great opportunity to get yourself socially and environmentally involved in, you know, a, 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 a group effort. So Ron, thank you for stepping up. It's great. Um, um, and Barbara, can I can I add one quick thing? We'd love to, Ron. The reason why I'd be enthusiastic about your doing this too is that uh, we hope to maybe try this same kind of model with um, senior living communities, where with ones like yours who might be interested. You know, so I think it would be great if you wanted to join in, and uh, uh, you know, and we can see how it works. Okay. I think I think the language you folks use when you talk about leaders and things like that can be a little bit anxiety producing to people because it sounds like a big commitment. And in reality, the commitment is hosting the videos, having conversations, and then hopefully being able to organize something to do to the community in the community that is of benefit that's environmentally related. It's, it doesn't. It's a, it doesn't seem like as heavy a lift as it sounds, and yeah. right. and, yeah, and no offense, but to have all those academic journal articles kind of makes it even a little more intimidating. But I know they're purposeful. Uh, yeah. No, that's okay. I think it's good. But you know, it can be intimidating to folks who aren't who aren't in academia or research anymore. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, and I think the only thing is, so yeah, so it's attendance at the, signing on, you're attending the events, and you're uh, hopefully getting a few other people to attend with you from yeah. your community. That's the goal. And then together, I don't think it's the leader's responsibility, it's that group's responsibility to think about a project. And obviously, it would be great if you could find a group project, but again, if not everyone agrees, then maybe individual projects, you know, but that yeah. participation in the in the program, kind of the last part is a some sort of project at some level, um, big or small. Um, <laughs> um, and nobody, by the way, needs to read a single one of those articles no, unless you're having no. trouble sleeping some night, you know. Uh, the one or two of them, if folks are interested, the one in the journal Generations is in the least amount of turgid academic prose. Uh, but for those who are interested, welcome to it. But, I, but I'm glad you raised that. That's just a background if folks want to know why we believe the program works and where how it's been effective in different contexts. I want to clarify, I'm not an academic too. So my background is public health and social work. <laughs> yeah, but you could play one on TV. 
Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, so just just to pop back to the chat, Barbara said use the term liaison for the group, and that's part of this being a pilot. We floated a bunch of different words to try to convey what we meant, and I think liaison or contact okay, words. Great. That's a great. Um, and then Edmund asked, have city councils of small and mid-sized cities been receptive to rise efforts? Um, especially with electronic vehicles, solar paneling, info and resources for their public youth education. Um, I believe, so we, our, our pilot was partially in Evanston, Illinois, which I guess is probably a mid-sized city outside of Chicago. I, I don't, yeah, probably a mid-sized city. Um, and I do believe we had folks sort of trying to interact with different um councils, different letter writing campaigns. And I think that much like with any volunteering effort, with any sort of project that you would do that would be like our capstone project, it can have like really good results, really positive results. Um, I don't have any examples off the top of my head. Um, and I think actually a lot of our speakers might be able to speak to it as well somewhat. Um, some of them have I don't think we're doing water reclamation this time around, but we did have someone talk about water reclamation and that's obviously like a governmental body. Um, Marie, did you wanna jump in? Um, yeah, no, just gonna say we are, we're doing water issues. Oh, are we? Um, Thanks. I can, yeah, I can, again, I can share the list of speakers. That's mm -hmm. helpful. Um, Daryl asked, are these open access journals? I do not know. I'm sure not we'd be all of them. Send. Not all of them. Um, but I could, I can probably, Carl, I think if that's all right, I might send that one article that he was talking about. I'll give it to you, Sarah, to send to participants if that's okay. Well, you know, I think all of them are either uh, open access or the PDF is on the website, right? But if anybody wants one yeah. that they can't access, you can certainly email us. Yeah, I'm just putting my email in the chat, which is also um, where you would email if you would like to register. Um, that in there. Um, and then Barbara in the chat asked, can you tell us what timeline you expect for the projects? Is there a certain length of time in which you hope we'll have this completed? So um, short answer, no. Uh, it really depends on the project, right? Because it could be a, a day of clearing invasive plants or it could be a months long campaign for a local election. Um, we, with our, our pilot that I participated in, we checked in with participants six months later just to um, first of all, have sort of a reunion, which was nice and to see where people were. Some people had completed their project. Some people were still working on it. Some people's life had gotten in the way and that was a good impetus for them to say, I'm gonna recommit, I'm gonna go do this. So ideally I'd say as soon after the eight week program concludes as possible so you don't lose that steam, lose that inertia. Um, but it, it really does depend on what your project is. Sarah Marie, can you also address how long the tapes will be available? Because I know there's a time frame there. So for the villages, we need to know that there is a, a window of opportunity here. Yeah, so again, with our initial pilot, uh, they were available for two months after the initial presentation. So, um, and again, that's just due to a lot of factors, but especially that you know, information can change, science can change, our speakers wouldn't necessarily want something up years, uh, you know, for years and have that information not reflect what they know now. So um, two months, so that would be, you know, from about mid-July to mid-September kind of trailing. And Sarah, could I add, there's, this is a really good point that there's a lot of flexibility in the program, but one area that's really part of the model is that to the most it can, that it take place in real time. Uh, you know, the timing works well, that people, if they're part of a group can also be interacting maybe before, you know, after the sessions or whatever. So it's not conceived of, and I'm not saying by the way that anyone was saying it was, but just to make sure, it's not like a freestanding educational program where they are just available YouTube videos. It's, it really is part of a, 
you know, comprehensive group project in which people are asked not to just to show up for one that they're interested in, but to really participate in the full, uh, you know, program. And that's one reason why we have never, you know, operated this program around people watching videos and discussing them. One of the main mechanisms by which RISE has been really effective is live interaction with the scientists and the ability to, uh, you know, ask questions and engage with them. So, uh, you know, the basic model isn't watching these as educational videos. The core of the model is that people are there live interacting with one another and, uh, you know, and the scientists um, during the discussion. So, as Sarah said, you know, the videos are there, if people miss it if it's just impossible. But, you know, the real hope is that everybody will be together and that there's a kind of sense of community around RISE. But again, Carl, to the point, villages have very flexible schedules and don't fit into when you're going to be doing this live presentation. So that's where the, the need for the videos to be available and to know what our time frame is for using them is important. Sorry yeah, to push no, no, back. I agree. I, no, I totally agree. That's that's true too. And then we will obviously be available after the two months too, you know, as needed for the capstone project. So other villages, please feel free to ask questions. Mm -hmm. Is this service available only to members? Um, I would say no, given what we've kind of talked about uh, with, with Ron's um, organization and with Eddie as well. If you work with or know of a group of people that, that would be interested, that sort of fits in the parameters, um, I think that that works perfectly well. Yeah, I think it's, the only caveat is that they're 55 and older. <laughs> Actually, Marie, is that really set? Because in my thinking of it, even though it's going to target the older adult, depending on when we do this at our local communities, um, we may actually make it open to families as well. Well, my participation in the eight week program, I mean, the program really is for uh, older adults. So that part, but the capstone stewardship project could be open to anybody participating if you're running, doing something in the community, I think. I mean, Carl, correct me if you don't agree. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it gets back to the videos thing is that these aren't for, I know it seems a little rigid, but you know, this is sort of part of our evaluating it. Like uh, the videos aren't in any way for distribution, offering to other groups of people to view. Uh, the videos are for the participants in RISE. And the reason why that's important is the speakers would probably orient themselves differently uh, if they were just giving a talk about their topic. We've worked with them around who the audience is. There's certain things too that they might not do, like have every citation for everything they say. So it's really important that, you know, it's not like sharing these in general, it's for the individuals who are signed up to participate in this program. Those can be additional individuals from other organizations or people who join in individually, but maybe you can explain, it's hard to imagine it's, sure. it's, it's not that I'm against it. It's hard to imagine how whole families might take part in this first pilot. Well, I guess. I, I'd be happy to give you an example. If I partner with my local park system and we have nature centers that have video rooms where people can go in and watch live feeds and things like that, chances are we'll do it at a time when families could come in with their children if they want it or with the older adult and watch the videos. I know for a fact that we're not going to be able to organize around Thursday presentation, live presentations. We need to probably think about doing it on weekends. And to think that I would ask a nature center to use their audiovisual and computer equipment to show something that's exclusively for a 55 plus community um, would be a disservice to the total mm -hmm. community, given that it's a public park. Right. Why don't we, it sounds like that's kind of 
specific. It feels like we should, I'm sure we can figure it out, but it is, you know, it is retirees in service to the environment. So it does have that focus. It's where our funding originates. And so we would just, I, you know, why don't we, uh, this seems like a good thing, you know, to take offline amongst us. I, I totally hear what you're saying, though. And I think it's just not something we'd anticipated. So we'd probably have to think it out a little bit. Given so that it should be, yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, given that Mather should be interested in intergenerational work, I can't imagine having to make a big deal out of it. I'm happy to have conversations with you guys if you want, but I also don't want to manipulate time. That's why I said let other villages have a say. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah, let's talk it out later. Yeah, Daryl has a question. Daryl. Yes, uh, I'm Daryl Baumgartner, and I'm here in Taos. I'm on the board here. I'm also an atmospheric scientist. My wife also is an atmospheric scientist. She actually served on the 2007 uh, Intergovernment Panel on Climate Change. And one of the things that I'm trying to do with our organization here is language is really important in helping to people understand how to understand the difference between global warming and climate change. You know, and Al Gore did a great job. Unfortunately, he did a bad job. He, he focused everybody on global warming as opposed to climate change. And it's climate change is really important to get across to people here and, and also to get across to people why climate change is not fake news and why it's really important to use the right language to get across to our members, you know, that this is real and how it, should, it experiences itself. And, and I'm I'm on today to try to better understand. I'm going to be listening to every workshop I possibly can, of course. But we have a whole range of members that have various types of capabilities and mobility and, and being able to go do things and other people that have to stay at home. But they have families and they speak to their children and they speak to their grandchildren. And so that's why I think it's really important and through RISE that we teach language, teach how to explain things in a way that are reasonable, reasonably easy to understand. So that's just, that's my two cents at the moment. I would just have a quick response. I'm so glad that you said that. It's really, it's a terrific point. All of the speakers are encouraged, you know, to talk about um, environmental communication on their issue. And one of the speakers whose name is Nancy Wells, who's an environmental psychologist, um, really focuses on some of those issues. So. Thanks. I think we could have really highlighted that more. That's that's definitely a key part. Is is how can you be, how can people become more comfortable talking about these issues with people they encounter in you know ways that are meaningful and non confrontational. I, I think. Um, thanks for that point. That's really key to the program. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, we have a question in the chat. Where is the funding coming from for this work? Um, a, a small portion is coming from Mather, which is a not-for-profit um, with some mission spending essentially to focus on our mission of helping older adults age well. Um, and then I don't know if any of the Cornell folks want to share details on your end. Sure. If you're in certain parts of the country, you'll know what cooperative extension is. And Cornell is the state's land grant. Um, university, so so um, um, a substantial portion of the funding has come through uh, essentially USDA that funds cooperative extension, and uh, Cornell itself has funded it through um, internal grants. And one thing I would want to say, the reason why the village's participation is so key in this is that uh, we really hope that based on this experience, we can go to foundations or to other sources and really have the proof of concept to be able to uh, you know, apply for more substantial funding and continue to expand this uh, in this partnership with Mather and the villages. But yeah, so right now it's been Cornell, it's been USDA through the cooperative extension system um, and some other small sources like donations from grateful Cornell alums. And Barbara asked in the chat uh, if the sessions will be at the same time each week. I had to double check, but that is 2 to 4 p.m. Eastern time um, on Thursdays. And I made a note 
you know, we may not always take a solid two hours, but um, sometimes the discussion and Q&A is so great that we wish we had more than two hours. So <laughs> I know that seems like a chunk of time sometimes. Um, Shannon in the chat had a question about creating a village. I think that might be separate from our yeah, work. And I'm, here, but I'm I looking for Shannon. I, I don't see Shannon in the participant. I was trying to oh. respond and okay. I don't see her. I have no idea what that's about. But Okay, I wanted to just make yeah. sure we weren't. No, I, I saw it. I was, I'm going through the participants. She must have dropped off. So I'm sure I'll hear from them. Um, any other questions? This has been really enlightening. I know that we tried to make this a quick, you know, Q&A. We're going to have another one next week, um, and um, hopefully, you know, maybe you can have some sidebar conversations with Carl and the team. Uh, Marie, most certainly, email Sarah. She's put her email in the chat. Um, there she is. Um, you know, feel free. I think this is a work in progress, and, and it's really been actually uh, constructive to do this today. So I, I appreciate everybody jumping on. As somebody else had asked about the schedule. So I'm gonna share, this is the draft, very much a draft, but I feel like there's been enough questions. So it's maybe it's worth looking at. So just in terms of May 11th, so it's, you know, it's two to four every Thursday, starting May 11th through June 29th. So it's an intro meeting. And then there's like an overview about climate change and the impact on the food system. And then these two may be switched. It's gonna be one on healthy environment, one on water issues, the next, you know, one on energy use with John Moore, the National Resource Defense Center, one on composting, one on climate change with uh, one of our, uh, well, Mick Smyers has its, his own organization called Growing Greener. And then one on the Capstone Stewardship Project. Again, so uh, those liaisons would be attending, with some other participants that might be, they, you know, those other participants may be on their own Zoom calls attending alongside them. Um, and then the liaison would be just making sure that they are, the other participants are in attendance, that they have any, they need to discuss things separately before or after, um, they wanna have discussions with the capstone. And then again, the capstone follows after June 29th. So I don't know if that's, that's just a little bit more information. Um, and uh, we will obviously send around a more complete schedule when it gets we get it finalized 100%. Um, might be a couple changes, but these are the speakers. <laughs> okay. And to register, Sarah, that you are the contact for that. So people know they want to register. Um, and someone asked if they register as a group or separately. Yeah, so um, I, I had put in the chat, ideally, we'd just hear from one liaison from the group. We, we certainly don't need, you know, a list of names and contact information from everyone in your organization who's participating. We would just like the counts. Um, and we know right now would be a time of um, reaching out to people, spreading this information. So we know that if you'd like to email me today and say, I would like to sign up as the liaison, I don't know if I'll have two people or 200. That is perfectly fine. Huh. We'd love to be at 200. I don't know. That's a lot. Dude, actually, yeah, we might, that might be a problem. Might be a problem. Well, let's be optimistic, you know? That... Yeah, a good problem. Yeah, and I think I do want to just encourage people to think that you're also helping build what we hope could be. I, I, I mean, I tend to be you know, overly optimistic, but that might be like a national model for how this kind of, uh, you know, environmental education that leads to enhanced civic engagement of, uh, you know, the baby boomers and beyond could take place. So we really hope that the feedback that we receive from everybody, as you can tell, it's a little bit of building the plane while flying it right now, but that allows us to be very flexible as we learn how this fits into the villages work, life, and context will know a lot more to be able to do it, you know, um, on a recurring basis and try to be a model for other groups trying to do the same kind of thing. So really help us to uh, improve our knowledge. As, this, as Barbara said, this conversation itself has really given us great ideas. So uh, we're very grateful to everybody who participates. And hopefully you will repay the, the kindness to the Village to Village <laughs> Network. Right. Who knows? Maybe there will be T-shirts or something. You know. I mean, yeah, you can have yeah. something. 
<laughs> Notice these fingers, they mean cash. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Back to those big funders. Well, thank That's you all right. very much. This is thanks been everyone so much. Thanks, thank Barbara. You. Anytime. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah Marie. Appreciate it. Yeah. Yes, Sarah Marie. Thank you for okay. your time. Yeah, Bye thank now. you. Okay, we'll be in touch. Okay. Bye-bye.